Is everyone ready? All right. Well, small crowd, but that's good, right? Then I can answer everybody's questions properly. My friend Jim Kramer probably could have filled this room at 2 in the morning, but I'm competing with lunch, and lunch and trading futures, I guess, is a big, it's a big dilemma. So today we're going to talk about trading the E-mini stock index futures, specifically the micro E-mini futures. Some of you may or may not be familiar with this product at this moment, but hopefully at the end of the class you know what it is and you know why it might be a good idea to consider using it as a hedging tool or a speculating tool and how you can go about getting started in something like that. So if you're not familiar with me, my name is Carly Garner. I run a futures and options brokerage service out of Las Vegas, Nevada. You're probably right in thinking there isn't much going on in Las Vegas when it comes to investing and trading and that sort of thing, but the weather is great there, so that's where I will stay. If you have any questions about today's presentation, here's my contact information. You can send me an email, give us a call. If you're on social media, we'd love to hear from you. You type DeCarly Trading into any of, the, any of the search boxes on Instagram or Twitter, Facebook, you'll find us. We try to post a lot of market commentary and things like that, charts, but we also post a lot of pictures of Frankie, my beagle. She's fun. So if you're not an animal lover, you might want to skip Instagram. I already mentioned I'm a broker, but I'm also a few other things. I write a column for Stocks and Commodities magazine. It's called Futures for You. I also contribute content to Jim Cramer's Mad Money. About once a month, he uses our market analysis on the show. If you're wondering, he is just as entertaining in person as he is on TV. But he's probably the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Most people don't get that from watching his show on TV, but he's an excellent, very, very friendly guy. If you are interested in learning more about trading futures and options or keeping up on the news, commodity market news, that sort of thing, I recommend you download our mobile app. Just search for DeCarly Trading in your app store. It can be the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. There, there is some restricted content. The restricted content is for our brokerage clients, which includes trading recommendations and uh, some more advanced commentary that we write. That said, you can sign up for a trial of that and test it out, see if you like it. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, what, some of the things that we do on Jim Cramer's Mad Money, such as market analysis, seasonal tendencies, COT report analysis, and even putting together a trading strategy, Higher probability commodity trading covers all of those things. Okay, so let's get started, but before we do, I want to make sure you understand this is risky. We're speculating. It's not investing. It's not um, like put, putting money in a mutual fund and letting it sit for 30 years. This is the exact opposite. This is active, tr actively trading, trying to beat the markets. It's not necessarily easy to do, and it's not for everybody. Trust me. And it might even make you cry. I've seen people cry. It's no fun. So before we get into the good stuff, I just want to let you know, um, well, give you my opinion on why I think trading futures is a good idea. If you saw my class a little earlier this morning at the CME booth, you'll hear some of the same things, but I want to make sure everybody understands. A, a lot of people are scared to trade futures because of the leverage and because of the risk involved, and that's good. You should be scared. It's scary stuff. But simply trading the SPY or the SPX instead of the futures, or maybe trading GLD instead of gold futures, that's not really the right answer. That's what people do because it's convenient, but it's highly inefficient. It's far less efficient. And I'm going to give you several reasons why the futures markets are not only more efficient, but just a better overall trading environment and giving you more control over what, what exactly you're speculating in. So people tend to flock towards what's familiar, but convenience is rarely the optimal choice. We know this in just about anything in life. If you need a gallon of milk and you buy it at your convenience store, you're going to pay a lot more for it than you would at Costco or wherever else. It would be less convenient, but probably a more efficient way to, to go about obtaining that, uh, that product. It's the same thing in futures. If you really want to trade commodities or if you really want to trade stock indices like the S&P 500, the futures really is an optimal vehicle to do that. And it is scary, 
but I'm going to show you how you can reduce your risk and your account volatility and all those things that you're scared of. And if you do that, you can take advantage of all the, the bright sides that there are to trading futures and options. So probably the biggest advantage to trading futures as opposed to trading stocks, the SPX, the SPY, and GLD, whatever it is on the stock side, is around the clock market access. You can buy or sell futures contracts in liquid markets 23 hours a day. It only pauses for one hour. As a broker, this means that I rarely get any time away or real, re really don't get any real time off aside from New Year's Day and Christmas Day and maybe one other in between. But the futures markets are almost always open. They open on Sunday night and they trade 23 hours and close for an hour on Monday. And then they trade another three hours, and close for an hour on Tuesday. They do that all the way until the Friday close. So the only day that really doesn't have any futures market activity is Saturday. I like to take that day to go hiking somewhere where I don't have any cell service and can forget about things. So when you trade futures, you have access to free leverage. Stock traders can gain access to leverage, but it's much more difficult. You have to get special permissions. You probably have to open a six-figure account to get those permissions. You also have to pay interest to your brokerage firm to do that. If you want to sell short in stocks, you have to borrow shares from your broker. You pay them interest, so on and so forth. In futures, none of that is necessary. If you want to go short, you simply press a button, you go short. If you want to trade on leverage, meaning you only have 5,000 in your account, but you want to trade $55,000 worth of crude oil, you can do that. I'm not saying that that's the right way to go about things, but you can do that. And you don't have to worry about paying anyone any interest. So we already talked about low account minimums. You can open a futures account with as little as $2,000 at most brokerages. Every brokerage has a different minimum, so don't use that as the gospel, but most places will open an account with that little amount of money. Also, I'm not necessarily saying that you should, although the product that we're gonna talk about today has a margin of only $700. So in theory, you could trade that product in a $2,000 account and actually give yourself quite a bit of room for error. So it's not that horrible of an idea, especially if you're somebody that's looking to transition from stock trading to futures and you just want to test the waters. This is a great way to do it. The, my favorite advantage to trading futures is the tax consequences. In futures, if you hold a position for two minutes or you hold a position for two months or any other time frame, it's all treated the same. You are taxed in a 60-40 blend between long-term and short-term capital gains. Also, you only have to report one figure to the IRS. You either made money or you lost money, you receive a 1099 at the end of the year, and you give that figure to the IRS, and that's it, it's that simple. It's not like stock trading where you have to list each individual trade, and then you have to worry about long-term capital gains and short-term capital gains. None of that exists in the futures world. And of course, futures trading is exciting, that's why people have interest in it, or that's why people don't have interest in it, because you can make or lose a lot of money in a very short period of time if you're trading in that manner. The thing I like to keep in mind, or let, make sure everybody understands is, you as a trader, you are predicting, or I'm sorry, you're controlling how much leverage you can use. So it, even though the exchange will give you a lot of leverage without questioning it, or like I mentioned, charging margin or anything, margin fees or anything like that, you don't have to utilize it. Now we do because we're humans, just like when we go to a buffet in Las Vegas, I'm from Vegas so I'll use some Vegas analogies. You go to a buffet, you pay your fee to get in, 20 bucks, whatever it is. You can eat four entrees and six desserts and it's all gonna cost you exactly the same as whether you ate, ate like a reasonable person. So as humans, we like to indulge because it doesn't cost us anything additional so we think it's the best way to go about it futures trading and in buffet patronism, that's the wrong way to do it. So, but anything is possible in commodities. I've seen people take a $10,000, well I've seen one person, take a $10,000 account to half a million in about two weeks. Then I saw the same person lose it all in about two, two more weeks. So that's just to give you an idea of how wild and how much money can be made or lost. 
Now that happened to be probably a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was 2007 when the market crashed and this guy was extremely aggressive. I would have never had enough guts to trade the way he did to make that happen, but I mean, it's just, I'm just giving you an example of just what can happen when things happen to go your way or go against you. So what are the micro E-minis? Micro e mini stock index futures, they were created by the CME to overcome the largest obstacle, keeping retail traders from trading futures, and that's risk. The micro E-minis are one-tenth the size of a regular E-mini S&P contract, or as we'll talk about later, there are E-mini micro DAOs, uh, there's a micro NASDAQ and a micro Russell. And what this does, it doesn't change the leverage. There's still leverage involved. You're still trading a lot more S&P stock than you're actually putting down as margin. So it's almost like when you buy a house and you put down 10 or 20% as your down payment, you're making or losing on the value of the entire house fluctuation. It's the same thing with futures. You're putting down kind of a down payment, that's your margin, but you're making or losing money based on the entire contract value. With the micros, the contract is very small. To give you an idea, each S&P point is worth $5. So if the S&P moves 10 points, you made or lost 50 bucks. If it moves 20, you made or lost $100. So that's a lot more manageable than the even S&P in which you make or lose $50. So for the average retail trader, making or losing $50 per point is a lot. And it's stressful and it's risky. So trading this product will eliminate a lot, well, not eliminate, but mitigate a lot of the emer emotional turmoil that comes with futures. And it gives people a chance to get their foot in the door without really having a lot of skin in the game. So there are four major micro contracts. Now keep in mind, there are also micro contracts in the currencies and gold. And there are excellent, excellent ways to get involved in currency and gold trading. Today we're only talking about the stock index micros, but just keep in mind there are those other products available. So if you have a long-term uh, idea or opinion in gold, and you want to express that through the futures markets, which is way more efficient than trading GLD or some of the other ETFs, you can do that with a 10-ounce gold futures contract and probably sleep pretty well at night because you're not going to get the crazy swings that you would get with the traditional 100-ounce futures contract. Now with the micros, they're small enough contracts that honestly they don't need options. So you're not gonna find options against the micros. I'm a huge fan of option trading, but when it comes to micros, honestly, it would be a waste of time to try to trade options around these small, this small of a product. But there is a micro in the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the Russell. So both the S&P and the Russell 2000 are $5 a point. The NASDAQ is $2 a point and the Dow Jones is 50 cents a point. So you can see that these are roughly the notional value. And what I mean by notional value is it's the value of how much S&P 500 stock you are controlling with your margin requirement. So in the S&P 500, the current margin is about 700. If the S&P is at 2,800, which is a little, it's actually closer to 2,900, but assuming it's a 2,800, that's a notional value of 14,000. And how we got that was we took 2,800 times $5, because each point's worth $5, and we get 14,000. So what that means in English is if you're trading one micro e mini s and you are basically making or losing money based on $14,000 worth of stock. Now remember, the margin's 700. So for $700 as a type of a down payment, you're making or losing on $14,000 worth of stock. Again, you don't have to leverage yourself to the max. You could, if you had a $14,000 account and you traded one micro, you basically have eliminated all the leverage. So you're in control of the leverage, not the exchange. Just like at the buffet, you don't feel like you're in control, but in theory, you are. You're the one making the decision. So it's the same in futures trading. So this is uh, really just for reference purposes in the, in the handout. But one thing to keep in mind is these, have, these are futures contracts, they do expire. So every quarter, the futures, well, 
stock index, each commodity is a little different. You'll find if you start venturing into other commodities, it gets a little bit crazy. But in the financials, there's basically four futures contracts expiring quarterly. So March, June, September, December, it's not like you can go along the micro e-mini and hang on to it for two years. You will have to roll over each and every quarter if that's the strategy you're doing is kind of a buy and hold. In all honesty though, if you're buying and holding, it, maybe the futures maybe isn't the best place for you. It's probably better for swing trading and hedging and that sort of thing. Buy and holding is great, but you do have to keep in mind you are missing out on dividends. Futures contracts don't pay dividends. So if it's just leverage you're going for, that's great. The futures market will fill that void. But if you want leverage in addition to dividends, um, it's a little bit tricky. When you may want to have a combination of like a traditional portfolio as in addition to your S&P 500 trading. Keep in mind also as, I, as we go through this, even though we're talking about a mini contract, it's a small contract, it's leverage, there's no dividends. So this is your speculative money. This isn't your um, retirement account, you know, buy and hold kind of money. This is a small percentage of money that you really don't want to lose, but if you did lose it, it's not going to ruin your life. So this slide is just to give you an idea of the difference between how much you would make or lose in a micro versus a mini. And this is a move that most of us probably remember. At the end of 2018, the market got a little bit out of control. We saw the, uh, the S&P drop from like 29.50 down to 23.50 in a relatively short period of time. If you, were, if you happen to be trading the E-mini S&P, which again is $50 a point, you would have made or lost 31,000. Now that's a lot of money, especially in a speculative account. So most retail traders look at that and they say, no way, I don't want to trade futures. But if you look at the micro profit and loss, you would have made or lost 3,100. Now that's something a little more manageable. Well, 3,000 is also obviously a lot of money for a lot of people. It took one of the biggest sell-offs in the S&P in a very long, in a decade for that to occur. So it's not something that's going to happen every day, but you can kind of get an idea of what your best case and worst case scenarios might be as a rule of thumb. So why trade the micro e-minis? Well, the great thing, I mean, the, obviously they're small and so they're easier to manage, but they also come with less margin. So you don't, you have less of a worry in regards to margin calls and that sort of thing. Also, you can hold them overnight. Anyone that's familiar with futures trading, there's a different margin requirement for day traders. Those are people that are out before the close and, and traders that are position trading and those are people that hold positions into the close. So believe it or not, day trading actually qualifies in a 23 hour period. So if you buy the open on, like let's say for example, the market opens tomorrow night. If you buy the open on Sunday night and you hold it all the way through the Monday close, that's considered in and out in the same session. That's a day set, day trade, even though you held it for 23 hours. As long as you're out by the close, it's considered a day trade. Now, as soon as you hold a position into the close, then suddenly you, your margin gets, goes a lot higher. So I just told you the margin on a micro S&P was 700. I was talking about the position margin. That's the full margin. So if you held into the close, you would need 700. If you were day trading that contract in and out in the same session, depending on the brokerage you're using, you may only need $100. So just to give you an idea how that works. But unfortunately, what a lot of people do is they over leverage themselves during the day session and they just don't have the wherewithal to hold into the close because they don't have the full margin amount available. So what do they do? They get out before the close, but trust me, the market could care less if you have to be out by the close or not. The market's gonna follow its, you know, its path and its pattern. Doesn't matter if you need to get out or not because of margin purposes. So if you're really trading in a manner that forces you to get out before the close, not because you want to or not because your signals run, run its course, but because you have to due to margin, you're really putting yourself in a position where you probably have very little chance of making money. Holding through the close is a big deal and it's a big advantage. So trading the micro will allow you to do that. Also the micro gives you lasting power. You're less prone to panic because it's not quite as stressful. 
even in a horrible day in the S&P, if the S&P is up or down 100 points, which is not something that happens often, but it is something that we've seen a couple of times just in the last few weeks, that's a $500 move on a micro. So sure, it's a little bit of a bummer, but it's not going to ruin your life. It's not gonna, you're probably not gonna have a bunch of sleepless nights over it. And in fact, you might feel comfortable if you get into a trade and you're on the wrong side of it by 100 points, you might feel comfortable adding on, doubling your position. And as we've seen this, this week, just because the market's down 80 to 100 today in the S&P doesn't mean it won't be up 40, 50 the next day. We've been seeing that over and over. So it makes a really big difference panicking and getting out when, on a bad day and being able to hold that position and maybe even add on to it to be there for the good day. So basically, there's more room for error. In my opinion, that's going to make better odds for success. There's less account volatility, obviously. You're going to be making or losing less as the market fluctuates. Some people might think that's a disadvantage, but trust me, trading is like golf. It's a mental game. If you're less stressed, and you're, you're going to make better decisions. It really is all it boils down to. If you've ever golfed, you absolutely know the harder you try and the harder you swing, the worse it gets, right? It's the same in trading. So even if you find this completely boring and you just think the micro is not going to move enough to make it worth your while, one thing it is great for also is paper trading. So if you have a new strategy that you want to test out, you can paper trade it for years and years and I'll tell you what, it really doesn't mean anything because when you're paper trading there's no emotions and you just don't get the full picture. With the micro, you're going to get at least a taste of the emotions so it'll be a little more realistic. So whether you're trading a new strategy or you're looking to trade futures coming over from a stock environment, this is a good way to give it a shot without, you, know, you have some skin in the game, but not enough to do a whole lot of damage. So I, everybody has a different personality and everyone has a different idea of what is the best way to trade. Some people like trend trading, some people like swing trading, my personality is more in tune with swing trading. I like to buy or be bullish in a market when everybody else is bearish. I like to buy the dips and sell the rips. This is a strategy that works more than it doesn't, but when it doesn't, it really, really doesn't. Like you're really, you could be really in a lot of pain if you didn't manage your risk correctly. So what the micro futures do, does is it gives people the opportunity to take advantage of that type of strategy without having a crazy amount of risk on the line. So if the market is, if you think the market's overbought and you want to go short, if you do it with a micro, you have enough room for error and you're, um, the contract is small enough, even if suddenly you get a big short squeeze because resistance was taken out, you probably as a trader can make a, an educated decision, should I stay in the trade, should I add on, and that sort of thing, as opposed to acting in panic and that nobody makes any money panicking. Also, it allows people to scale in scale out of trades. The big boys, the big traders, that's exactly what they do. They rarely will be all in or all out. If they're bullish in a market, they'll buy a few here. The market dips, they might buy a few more. Maybe if the market goes up, they may add a few more, depending on what their, their system is. But they're never getting all in at the same time, and they're never getting all out at the same time. If a position goes in their favor, they'll slowly peel off contracts, because they know just as well as all of us we can't tell the future. We don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes or 10 hours, but we look at the chart and we make guesses accordingly, and so we want to mitigate our, our risk by scaling in and scaling out. Generally, when you do that sort of thing, you get better average prices. It's not any different than dollar cost averaging, which is the basic principle of investing. So this is a 60-minute chart or a one-minute chart of the E-mini micro. And it covers about a week, let me see, yeah, about a week or so, maybe a week and a half. And I'm not in any way suggesting that it would have been extremely easy to sell all the highs and buy all the lows. But the reality is most markets trade in ranges. So if you come in with the mentality of, I want to sell into resistance and buy into support, as I mentioned before, it's going to work more than it doesn't. You just have to be careful the time that it doesn't, you don't lose everything you just made, plus maybe even blow out your account, and that's the trick. 
With a full-size even ESMP contract, you probably wouldn't be very comfortable doing this. You know, if you sell um, each level of support and resistance, just to put this into perspective, so you can see how much you might be making or losing on a micro. The range starts out at about $200 up here, so each ebb and flow is about $200, and then we get back down here, it's where it's, the range is a little bigger, it's about $400. Now, keep in mind, the mini, I'm sorry, the micro is one-tenth the size of the mini. So with a micro, you could see how you could keep your wits about you, right? I mean, you're making or losing $400 to $400 as the market's swinging. You're probably pretty comfortable selling when you should, when the market's overbought, there's resistance, odds are it's gonna help hold. But suddenly if you're trading a mini, which is 10, si 10 times the size, your thought process is gonna change. You're gonna be a little too scared to sell the highs and so you probably get in late once you see the market rolling over, so on and so forth. Or maybe you're gonna place a tight stop because you don't wanna risk more than X number of dollars and guess what? If you notice this trend line held, held most of the time, but it almost always pokes a little below or a little above the trend line. And you see that almost all the time. And that's just exactly what that is, is pe running people stops. People like to think that there's some gun someone out there gunning for their stops. That's just, that's not true. It's just how markets work. Everyone tends to put their stops in the same place. Everybody wants to be a buyer when the market's high. Everyone wants to be a seller when it's low. And in reality, more often than not, you'd be better off doing the opposite. So you'll notice down here, suddenly the, the system that was working pretty well before fails. To give you an idea of what's at risk here, the market drops uh, from about 28.50 to about 28.10. So we're talking probably 40 to 50 points, roughly, in the S&P. Not so bad, that's 200, 250 bucks. So, with a full-size contract, you're talking $2,000, $2,500. So it's just such a big difference in your mental, uh, your mental state that I argue that you're probably gonna make a heck of a lot better decisions trading the micro. Even though you're not gonna make or lose as much money, you're probably gonna stay around a long time. You can kind of perfect your skills and just put yourself in a better spot to actually be profitable. As a broker, I hate to say this, but most people lose money trading futures and most people lose money that are speculatively trading stocks. It's just the reality. It's not that the markets themselves are overly risky. I think it's just people don't understand how to uh, manage their emotions, manage their risk, so on and so forth. So another use for micro e-minis is to hedge a portfolio. So some of you might be more interested in this. This is a because this is a money show and not a trader's expo, tend to be more long-term investors than necessarily active uh, speculators. So this is for you. Most people don't realize this or they forget that the futures markets were, they were created to hedge risk. The reason the futures markets exist is because farmers in the Midwest needed to hedge their crop risk. And what that means is farmers or ranchers or end users of commodities, they needed a place where they could shift their risk to speculators and that's exactly what's happening. So when you're participating in the futures markets, you're potentially taking the other side of somebody's trade that's hedging, not speculating. Futures trading is on paper a zero sum game. For every winner there's a loser and that's where you're seeing the price risk transfer. So if somebody goes long corn and someone else goes short corn, there's no way for both of those people to make money. One's gonna lose and one's gonna make, but in the end, there, it's a zero sum game if, if, you, if you ignore transaction costs. So because of that's the way that the futures markets work, you can use that as a stock investor as a tool to hedge your stock portfolio. And let me tell you what, what I mean by that. So hedging is the practice of taking the opposite position in a correlated asset to mitigate price volatility. The perfect hedge really doesn't exist. Everybody wants to assume it does, or on paper they do the math and they think it does, but in reality, markets are a little messy. It's never gonna be perfect, but you can have a really good, efficient hedge if you design it properly. So let's assume that you have, we're just gonna keep it simple, so we'll keep it to one last. 
Let's assume you have $14,000 worth of S&P 500 stock that you want to hedge your price risk on. Let's say you think the market's a little toppy. You want to eliminate or mitigate your price risk. If you wanted to completely eliminate it, you could sell one E-mini S&P micro future against your long $14,000 worth of S&P stock in your stock portfolio. And you completely almost eliminate your price risk. But in the meantime, you're still collecting dividends on your stock portfolio. So you've taken all the price risk away and still kept the dividends. So it's the best of both worlds. You're basically making money on one hand and losing it on the other. You're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, but the stock market goes up almost always. And that's true. So you don't ever want to be perfectly hedged or attempt to perfectly hedge if the stock market's cheap. You might want to do it if the stock market's expensive. In my opinion, you probably never want to be perfectly hedged, but maybe partially hedged some of the time. So let's say you had $50,000 worth of S&P stock and you wanted to partially hedge. You could sell one micro against it, and at least you're hedging 14,000 of that portfolio. So it doesn't have to be fully hedged. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can, you know, based on your risk tolerance and your opinion on what the market might do in the next couple of months, you can create your own uh, situation. So the great thing about the micro products is there, it isn't just the S&P. It's the Dow, the NASDAQ, the Russell, and the S&P. So you could hedge a portfolio that has all types of different stocks. It might be tech stocks, small caps, blue chips, whatever it is, you can probably get a pretty good hedge on. So let's say that you had an account um, of $140,000 that's relatively balanced between these asset classes. Conceivably, you could sell one or two contracts of each of these, depending on how aggressively you wanted your hedge to be. Now, I do warn that, you again, you never want to be fully hedged unless you really think the stock market's crazy. So maybe um, January 2018, when the S&P was control uncontrollably rallying, maybe a time like that, it might make sense to be 100% hedged because that was just off the charts crazy. But in a more normal market situation, you don't want to give up all your upside potential because the market almost always goes up. And also, when the market does sell off, it's a good idea to peel your hedges off. If your hedges are making you money, take it off the table. People are scared to do that because they, they think, well, what if the S&P continues lower and now I don't have as, as good of a hedge as I used to have? But the reality is, if you had any hedge at all and you're locking in profits on your hedges, you're better off than most people. And let's say the market corrects 20% and you lifted all your hedges off at 10. You still are way better off, right? You still, you didn't withstand a 20% drawdown. You only did a 10% drawdown. You're probably going to be happy with that. So don't be scared to take it off if you think you're comfortable with the risk in doing so. So again, the the takeaway of this is hedge when you can, not when you must. Peel off hedges incrementally as the market falls. If you never, I also want to point out, if you never lock in a gain on your hedge, it did, really didn't do anything for you. If you would have hedged in December of 2018, it, right before the market crashed, or if you want to call it a crash, right before it sold off, but you never took, that, took a profit on that hedge and you wrote it all the way back, you probably did save yourself some emotional turmoil, but you're really not any better off. So remember, if you don't take a profit on your hedge, it doesn't really matter. It's almost like it didn't exist. So this is just a reminder. This is the exact same chart we looked at before. Again, if you would have never locked in your profits on your hedge, Came, the market came all the way back. So you didn't do yourself any good. You paid a couple commissions you didn't need to pay, um, you know, all those sorts of things. Don't be afraid to take off your hedge and, and lock in a profit. Because we know the markets almost always go up, we know that unless we get a repeat of 2007, 2008, anytime you're locking in profits on your hedge, it's probably a good thing. Even though if it feels like the wrong time, it's usually a good time. I mean. I, if you remember in December, very few people thought the market was going to bottom and rally back. 
We have we actually, we went on Kramer and said we thought exactly that. We did think the market was going to bottom out and rally back. Um, to be honest, I'm kind of surprised we didn't get more pullbacks in between. But I mean, you just never know. The, the point is, when the market looks horrible and everybody thinks it's going to go to heck in a handbasket, is exactly when it usually doesn't. Um, in today's market, I think we're trading 2,900 in the S&P. We're not that far from all-time highs, yet the mass consensus is we're going into recession. There's yield curve inversions. Everyone should panic. My opinion is because everybody believes that, I think we're probably going to do the opposite. But we'll see. Time will tell. OK, so one other thing to keep in mind is our brokerage, we do a lot of option trading. Most of our clients are trading options. Most of the recommendations we put out are option related. So I wanted to throw this in here. It's a little off topic, but you can use the micros to hedge your option trades. So even if you're trading SPY or SPX options, which I prefer trading e mini S&P futures options, I think it's a better vehicle. But regardless, you can use these to hedge your option trades. So if you're short calls, you can buy micros against it to lower your delta. As a reminder, delta is basically how quick your position moves relative to the underlying market move. So just keep that in mind that you can hedge your options with micros. And this kind of gives you just a brief example of how something like that might work. Some even use the micros for cover calls. Now keep in mind, if you're trading E-mini S&P options, those are based on the full size E-mini contract, not the micros. So if you sell an E-mini S&P call and you buy one micro against it, you can calculate your delta. You're going to be, depending on how you structure it and how you place your strike price, you can get yourself delta neutral or whatever it is that you want to be. But you just have to keep in mind, the closer that the futures gets to that option, your delta is going to change. In fact, your delta will start to get really heavy on the option side. So you want to be careful with that. <clears throat> so in, I went, I'm sorry, I skipped through that a little quickly. But if you have any questions about those slides, feel free to send me an email and I'll answer those. I wanted to make sure we get, got through everything so I could answer everybody's questions. But for those looking to speculate with lower risk, less stress, and better odds of success, the micro futures, in my opinion, is a great way to go. Also, if you're looking to hedge your portfolio, and too few people do this, it's such a simple thing. If you're, I mean, markets generally go up over time, but they don't go straight up and they don't go up forever. And you don't want to put yourself in a situation that you're selling out of panic. You want to, when the market gives you big drawdown or a big dip, you want to be playing offense, not defense. And so just keeping these products in mind as a way to put yourself in a better position to react to market sell-offs is something you should keep in mind. So I appreciate everybody coming out. If you have any questions or if you want to learn more about trading futures and options on futures or maybe even just hedging your portfolio. We have several trading videos on our website, decarlytrading.com. You can also sign up for a free trial of our newsletters. We do issue trading recommendations. We give you some ideas. We say, here's the chart. Here's where we think the market might go. Here's how we think is the best way to play it. And we play it all the way to the end. So we don't just leave you hanging. We'll tell you when to get in, when to adjust, and when to get out. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up for a free trial on our website. And I've written, I've actually written four books, and I've written a couple of them multiple times, so be careful. If you do have interest in learning more and you want to visit Amazon and purchase these books, honestly, they're available at any major book outlet. But I wanted to give you a warning. If you go to Amazon, you'll see some of the older books that I've written that are out of print because we had an, a, we switched publishers. Don't worry about those. These are the only two books you should worry about. The others are, they're available on, from like third market third-party sellers, and they're crazy expensive, and they're not worth it. I'm actually rewriting them anyway, so. Anyway, if you have any questions, here's my contact information, and I would love to hear from you. I do have a couple minutes if anybody has a question here. 